Today is June 18, 2023. We have a very special guest on the show today, Toivo Ashekwe. Uh, Toivo Ashekwe is an assistant professor at Georgia State University. Dr. Dr. Ashekwe is a scholar activist whose research interests intersect the disciplines of historical sociology, history, and Africana studies. Dr. Ashekwe comes from the Black internationalist background with parents who have fought for the freedom of peoples of African descent on both sides of the Atlantic. Dr. Ashekwe is a committed grassroots activist, and as a scholar activist, he has published widely on, the, on Black consciousness and Black power and peer-reviewed journals such as the Journal of Southern Africana, African Studies and the Journal of African American History. And Dr. Ashekwe's dissertation won the Dissertation of the Year Award 2019 at Binghamton University. On June 8th, 2023, Dr. Ashekwe published the important and must-read book, which we will, which will be the main topic of today. Um, it's entitled Arming Black Consciousness, the Azanian Black Nationalist Tradition in South Africa's Armed Struggle, 1967 to 1993. It's a must read, please check it out. Um, it's available on Amazon, even though we know Amazon's a problem. <laughs> um, it can be found, I don't know if, if, I actually don't know for sure, Dr. Shekwe, can it be found in other bookstores already or? Uh, there's a number of bookstores, uh, just real quick, quick correction. Um, last name is said Asheke. Just Asheke. Asheke. No, you're perfect, yeah, there you go, perfect, perfect. Asheke. No, it's available at Barnes and Noble, there's something called Black Dot, there's some various publishers like in the UK. I just don't know some of these things in these stores in the UK. In Atlanta, there's a, there's a number of places that I've seen it um, online pop up. So yeah, it, I think it actually is available. Um, I think it's available um, in a number of places outside of Amazon. Okay. Um, and I wanted to know that the, I first learned of your work when uh, you were interviewed on Black Agenda Radio in 2020 regarding an article you published entitled Black Power and Armed Decolonization in Southern Africa, Sophie Carmichael, the African National Congress of South Africa and the African Liberation Movement. Um, so I was particularly excited that uh, when I learned you published this book and I'm truly honored to have you on the show to discuss this book and to continue to learn from you. Um, so welcome to the show. Um, and again, it's an honor to have you on the show. Um, so this just so uh, jumping into your book, which uh, is fresh off the press. Um, one of the reasons your book um, is so important is because it moves beyond the well-trodden histories of South Africa's liberation struggle to tell the previously neglected story of the Black consciousness consciousness movement. Um, you also uncover the personal and political histories of those who have previously. Uh, received scant scholarly attention. Can you explain what the Black conscious, Consciousness Movement was and give an overview of its impact on the South, Southern African liberation struggle? All right, no, absolutely. Thank you for that question. Okay, so um, where do we begin Black Consciousness? So um, again, given I know the audience is international and um, very much, you know, a lot of my audience, you know, will be in the US as well as the UK and stuff. So some of this stuff isn't as well known. So I'll engage in a lot of comparison that are not always perfect, but it's going to just gives a broad sense of things. Um, so the Black Consciousness Movement essentially was a movement that emerged in the late 60s in um, South Africa. Some of us Black nationalists will call it, um, you know, Azania and the rejection of the name South Africa, right? Um, but just for I may switch back and forth between the two, Azania and South Africa, um, basically emerged in the late 1960s in South Africa after, if you will, there was a level of a void in organized, you know, informally organized Black South African politics, right? Um, radical politics against the apartheid regime. Um, for those who know, 1960, you have your Sharpeville massacre, where basically a organization that split from the African National Congress in 1959 um, well, formally split in 1959, called the Pan-Africanist Congress emerges as sort of this like um, like a Black nationalist alternative to the ANC. Um, they split essentially because in 1954, there's essentially a document that's put together called the Freedom Charter. And the Freedom Charter essentially was um, a document put together by a number of white leftists and some radical groups. Uh, the Communist Party had been banned in 1950, so they went underground and emerged in different 
uh, formations. Um, the African National Congress, sorry, the African National Congress, which at the time was um, representing, if you will, the African population. You had, um, I believe, you had uh, representation from some of the other uh, ethnic groups as well. Um, um, you know, the co some colored colored groups as well, as well as some of the, I believe, the South Asian groups. Some people re have representation there. Um, as well as some of the white groups that were there as well, right? The idea was to have this document that could speak to all the people in South Africa. Many of the um, black nationalists rejected this, however, because they felt that it's not about representation with all the different groups here. We are an African country. There's no, the, the, to have some of the different representation is not necessarily the, the key point. And the key thing also was that in the state, there's a key clause in the Freedom Charter that stated, the land belongs to all who live on it, both black and white. That became irreconcilable, irreconcilable, particularly because the majority of land in what is not what is what we call South Africa has been taken from uh, the African peoples. So they split. Um, so the split was actually had its roots a little earlier than that because some of these tensions were there earlier. But it, um, 1954 really kind of sets the sets the ball rolling. And by the end of the 50s, the split happens. And in 1960 March, the PAC under the leadership of Robert Sabukwe um, basically have this big protest. Um, basically, like this burning of passes, because Africans at the time you had to have a pass um, to base to, to show that you had permission to be in the white in the white areas, right? You, had, you know, where were you working? Essentially, who was your boss? Who was your master? So, who, who, you know, who's responsible for you? Essentially, what are you doing here, right? And the idea was, no, we need to uh, uh, burn this and reject this. This is not the first time this had happened. Um, African women had protested this earlier um, in the century, um, and that also is one of the things that isn't as talked about. As much you talk about black women's protests, women had been protesting this a long time ago because it also was restrictive for them and what they needed to do. And so they had already had protests earlier um, in, in the century, in the early 20th century, they already had this. Um, so to fast forward to black, this is important for black consciousness because when this Sharpeville pro when this protest happens across South Africa on March 21st, um, you essentially have in the town of Sharpeville. Um, you have um, essentially violence that begins to break out in this nonviolent protest. The police shoot into a crowd of people, and this kind of triggers, if you will, um, uh, a whole bunch of repression across the country. Um, and so in the aftermath of this huge repression, um, the African National Congress, as well as the um, Pan-African Congress, they are banned as organizations. And so the leaders have to go underground. Um, some had already been doing this earlier, but it wasn't as systemic as it, as it was going to become. Um, and in the wake of this, you have rebellions. You know, the ANC creates its armed wing in 62. Um, the PAC also forms its own armed wing called Fuoco, um, which basically means like alone, standing alone in Ikosa. Um, some of the languages, one of the languages in South Africa. And um, essentially, you have these urban rebellions, sorry, you have these rural rebellions happening across South Africa in the 1960s. Um, the ANC does is more, is more urban, the ANC is more urban rebellions, if you will. Think IRA destroying, you know, uh, infrastructures of the state, if you will, right? So like, you know, power lines, um, uh, electric grids, um, the pass offices, blowing up roads, railways, these kinds of things, right? Versus Poco was more about we're going to attack white settlers directly, right? And that already tells you the different orientation between the two, right? Just from the beginning right there. But in the wake of this, the apartheid, uh, the, 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 the war machine was very effective at crushing uh, dissent and they were able to crush some of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the resistance that was happening. Of course, they didn't destroy it, but they were most definitely able to arrest hundreds, if not thousands of people. And many of the other leadership have to flee into exile. Mandela is captured at this point. Govan Mbeki is captured at this point. So Bukwe is arrested for the PAC. A number of other leaders have to flee into exile of other organizations, um, such as from the Unity Movement, which is a different organization that doesn't get enough credit, I think, also internationally as well. So within this void, if you will, of some of these more formal organized organizations being, you know, the leaders have to run uh, into exile to get some support, right, to kind of lick their wounds and to reorganize. Um, many who are inside have to go even further underground, right, and other leaders are in prison and many have been, were killed also during this period of time, too. So within this void, if you will, um, the Black Consciousness Movement begins to more to formally emerge in the late 1960s. Um, the, the Black Consciousness Movement for, again, it's tricky in South Africa only because um, oftentimes there's always this issue is like, you know, what does Black nationalism mean in an African continent if everybody's, if everybody, or the majority, the vast majority is Black as it were, right? And that's also part of the motivations of writing this book is again, to kind of understand that particularly if you're looking at white settler colonies, right? Um, the race question is very much central, right? Um, and black nationalism, of course, um, again, is a word that we just call particular types of 
formations, right? And um, the uh, black consciousness most definitely emerges from that. Very more, very much more closely aligned to the PAC, the Pan Africanist Congress, and more aligned to, I would say, the Unity Movement, but also very influenced by the ANC as well, because the ANC always prided itself on being like a broad church. So having like a lot of different things under it, right? We got communists, we got anarchists, we got liberals, we got black nationalists, we got bang, 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 bang right? And so um, you do have many in that formation who were, I would say, also black nationalists, right? And so part of what this book also sometimes we're trying to, part of what this book is trying to do also is to try to map out organizationally what does black nationalism look like? Oftentimes we get stuck in some of the talking of what black nationalism is, right? You know, cultural nationalism, revolutionary black nationalists, like, you know, all, you know, you know black Marxists and da, da, da. So organizationally, what does that look like in terms of organizational expression, right? So black consciousness essentially emerges kind of trying to deal with these questions. How do we fill this void? How do we mobilize people to fight apartheid in a repressive fascist white supremacist settler colony, right? That is being backed by international capitalism and the anti-apartheid movement was not what it was, what it became then. Everybody of the West was completely behind the apartheid regime. Uh, gold was trading at an all time high, right? The RAND was very strong in, very strong in global currency, right? Um, uh, and they were supporting that repression, right? 76, which actually was um, celebrated a few days ago, um, June 16, 1976, um, is a different, something different happens there than 1960. In 1976, there's more condemnation against the apartheid South African regime. That was not the case in 1960, right? And so um, essentially black consciousness was very much inspired verbally, if you will, um, by the black power movement, if you will. They were listening to the, you know, black radical music, Nina Simone, James Brown, you know what I'm saying? All these cats, right? The jazz, they loved it, right? Stokely Carmichael, the Black Panthers, um, Jillian Muntaquim, you're talking, you were talking about them just recently. People were inspired by them as well, right? Eldridge Cleaver, Kathleen Cleaver, Angela Davis has a lot of resonance with them, right? As well as, again, they are maybe more immediately also inspired by the African liberation movements around them, right? Um, Africa is becoming independent, right? Um, by 1963, most of the African continent at least has formal flag independence, as Walter Rodney used to call it, others used to call it, right? Um, and so they're inspired by these currents, right? We also need this independence too, because if you think about it, technically speaking, quote unquote, um, as one of my old um, white advisors used to argue with me on this point, and I never backed down this point, I have always maintained that Africa is still not, still colonizing, in my opinion. But if you're going to say independence, it would have to be 94. But a lot of people will argue, well, technically speaking, the British hand the mandate to the white South Africans in the early 20th century after the Second World War, essentially, right? And it becomes a republic, um, essentially, I want to be yeah, early in the 20th century as well. So technically speaking, they could argue we, we, we are independent, <laughs> right? Um, um, although, of course, the Black population being suppressed in very similar conditions to the United States. So Black consciousness is inspired by this. They're reading Fanon. They're reading Cabral, whose quote you have up there, right? Um, they're reading a number of different people, and now they're trying to figure out okay, cool, how they are, are inspired by the ANC. They're inspired by the PAC. Different um, people who come join the movement have different um, ideological legacies. Some people come from families that are ANC. People like Biko came from families that was more PAC. Some people were um, aligned to neither, but came from rural rebellions, right? People in the rural areas whose land had been taken, who maybe they're cool with ANC today or PAC, whatever, but they fight for their land in liberation, right? Whoever, which whenever you can support us, we'll support you, right? But they're doing their own thing, right? Um, there are those who are coming into new consciousness, right? So this is what the Black Consciousness Movement was doing. Um, the first organization that we'd say that comes under it would be SASO, the South African Students Organization that emerges at the historically, if you will, they call them Bantu universities, right? Think of them as historically Black colleges and universities that the South Africans did have to institute. Because if you are going to do this thing about separation, apartheid separation, the ideas are supposed to be separate, right? And we're going to, quote unquote, give independence to these different ethnic groups. You do need to train a particular kind of an educated, popular, quote unquote, uh, formally uh, educated population um, in order to manage some of these uh, functions of the state, right? And so they emerged, uh, Sasso emerges on the college campuses and then it begins to radiate outwards in terms of organizationally. But part of, I think, with the argument of my book also is to say that, let's, that we cannot conflate the emergence of Sasso with being the emergence per se of black consciousness, right? Because sometimes what the critique will be is that, well, uh, you know, the black consciousness movement because people focus on Sasso and of course Steve Biko here is that it's a student movement, intellectual movement, idea people, but not actually nuts and bolts in the grassroots, you know, in the villages, you know, on the streets of Soweto and the townships, 
mobilizing on the grassroots in that level, right? Um, for me, I think it would be it would be a similar uh, statement by saying, well, you know, the Black Power movement is kind of founded by the Black Panther Party. I, I would disagree with that, right? Or to say SNCC is the only, you know, is the Black Power movement. It's a, that that also not necessarily accurate, right? These things are happening before, you know, you know, or do or, or have deeper currents, right? Um, we just spoke about um, Malimo Umoja just recently. You know, part of what Umoja was doing, a part of as with others in the late 1990s, early 2000s, is also kind of breaking this false dichotomy, uh, breaking this false dichotomy between, um, you know, this passive South, right, and then it's this more radical, urbanized rebellions in the North, right, and actually arguing, you no, know, you look at your deacons for self-defense, you look at your other organizations in the South, right, people have always been doing some of these things that could be classified as Black power, right. So I want to keep that in mind when we think about black consciousness. It simply is more of an organizational expression at a particular time to meet a particular need um, after the repressions of the early 1960s that very much gave voice to a black nationalist politics that was rejecting, if you will, of the idea of you know uh, multiracial, you know multiracial, you know uh, intermixture, if you will, as the way to like um, you know liberate South Africa. They lose out. But um, at the time, my argument is they were very, very powerful, particularly in the 1970s. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, in uh, Dr. Omoja's book really is like a companion or like they really go well together with this. This, this book and Dr. Omoja's book really go well together. And one of my like follow up questions to what you just explained is the black consciousness movement engagement with guerrilla warfare. Um, and why, why didn't. Why was their engagement with guerrilla warfare through the ANC or the Pan African Pan Africanist Congress of Bazania, P the PAC? Um, you know, why why did they not go through the, the PAC or or the ANC? Good question. Okay, so um, they many of them do. So now this is a good question, right? Um, because of the political repression of the time, people had to be tricky with how you organize it because you have to organize you kind of in and out of the system right you kind of have to like you can't just you know you can't just make this declaration we're going to organize a revolutionary movement we're going to take down white supremacy we're going to burn this and blow up that i mean you know you actually have to like mobilize in different kinds of ways right um you know here we talked about the idea you have, you have your above ground formation and you kind of does what it can do to build up this underground until the underground then it like gets banned and then the underground of course does what it has to do right um so because they had to be tricky, you had to kind of pull, I, what they felt was we have to pull the different sh black strands together into a space first. Let us get together, let's actually think about what the F is going on. Because the, the reality was, particularly with the ANC, the ANC barely survived this period, right? Um, if it's not for USSR support, the ANC would have fallen by this time, and I'll stand by that, right? Because their leadership got, got taken. You know what I mean? At Lily's Farm, um, the, their top military leadership, outside of a few exceptions, are all arrested by the mid 1960s, right? That is a huge blow for any organization, no matter who you are, right? When all of your leadership is taken out in one swoop, basically in a few in a few years, right? So part of what they had to do was to bring the different strands together to get different people now talking and discussing and building with each other. And so you have people who were aligned to ANC or PAC or the unity movement, right? The unity movement, for just lack of a better word, they kind of get accused for being as being Trotskyist, if you will, um, at the time, because they were very, very critical of the South African Communist Party and the ANC. And I do believe in the 1940s, I would say in parts of the 50s, I do believe they're the more radical organization in South Africa as compared to the ANC. They just don't get a lot of burn and they're kind of, again, dismissed as intellectuals and um, predominantly people of mixed race descent sometimes, et cetera, et cetera. But I think if you go deeper in their history, they were they, they came down correct on a whole bunch of different points. But to answer your question more directly is that because of this, it was in some ways a broad nationalist movement, right? You have a lot of people who are here, but it was clear that some of the key people in the movement and some of the broader um, masses of the movement were clearly moving in a particular kind of, I would say, a revolutionary black nationalist direction. Now, Many people, the reason why people initially were not trying to join the ANC and PAC is because people didn't see them doing anything, right? The ANC really doesn't become, let's say, MK, un punto y cisme, right? Is um, the spear of the nation. It doesn't really become what popular memory makes it out to be until post-1976. That's when it becomes a little bit more of what we, what we, what we kind of know it to be. 
And even that is has a direct contribution to black con uh, black consciousness, in my opinion, and my book argues directly contributes to that wave. So in those early years, really, MK just didn't have a presence, to be blunt. People didn't know what it was. People didn't even know what the ANC was because there was a whole bunch of silence and fear around speaking about these revolutionary organizations. And so these black groups had to study, they had to be secretive, they had to learn this stuff that hasn't been taught before, right? And, um, and so initially, because they didn't see the MK doing anything, some folks had seen Poco, um, um, the, the PACs um, doing a few, but even um, the PAC, they had a whole bunch of chaos themselves trying to organize an armed uprising in South Africa um, after they were crushed themselves in the in the early to mid to mid 1960s, and so people weren't seeing an armed wing. So because they didn't see these things happening in their direct areas, um, some go into exile to try to figure out okay, what's actually happening, right? And some do join the ANC, some do join the PAC, but many of but the cats who I follow, they come out some of them in, my, in the first half of the book, and they're just like, whoa, whoa y'all are not doing what. <laughs> Y'all not doing what we thought. A, we can't see you inside the country doing anything and just seeing what's going on out here. No, this is not actually, you actually aren't organizing in, in, in the appropriate way for a radical armed uprising um, to take state power and to overthrow apartheid rule um, in, in, in early 1970s of Africa. So they form their own armed wing. And they do so without the support of the USSR, which is always critical and key, because they were also not completely aligned to the PAC because the PAC organizationally was destroying itself in in its internal fractures and fights. And so many of them did not want to get involved with that, um, different wings that were emerging within the PAC itself. Many of them also, those of you who know, the whole thing on the Sino-Soviet split, right? Um, many people also wanted to avoid that nonsense because it had nothing to do with what we're trying to do on the African continent for liberation right now, right? And the argument was China and Russia, I don't care what your beef is, both y'all should be supporting us. <laughs> right, uh, and don't ask no questions. But that, of course, was not what actually ends up happening. So the Black Conscious Movement is not supported by the, by China, not supported by um by by the USSR, and also struggled to get support formally. That is from what was called the frontline states, basically many of the independent African countries that were around um apartheid South Africa, such as Zambia, um, Rhodesia at the time is still under colonial rule, as we know. Um, uh, Mozambique uh, is still under Portuguese uh, rule until the, until the mid 1970s after the Carnation Revolution, et cetera, right? Um, Tanzania, of course, is the hub of the African liberation movement at the time. They are more PAC aligned. Um, they, in my interviews with some of the leaders, some of the people who are still around who are in the Tanzanian government at the time, um, they weren't really embracing of black consciousness. Um, so these cats had to really mobilize like true Maroons, literally like without state support and literally having to use grassroots organizational methods um, to build their armed wing. So I give those those things to say there were some who did join the ANC, right? There were some who did join the PAC and if there's a hole in my book, I just was unable to do as much as I would have wanted to show those who joined the PAC and what happened to them, right? Um, that's that's, that's a, one of the whole, many, many holes in my book. But to more, to now go back again to answering your question again, uh, where you will see people joining the, the ANC and MK is post-1976. Um, after the Soweto uprising, this now dr drives thousands of young people into exile, and the majority of them do go to and they join MK. My argument is this is not because they ideologically agree with MK. MK was simply the more organized. As many of us know, oftentimes who takes power in particular chaotic situations, those who are the most organized, not the most radical usually, those who are the most organized. If you were organized, you will take, you can be, you can take and seize power. If you're not, you're not going to, at least in a formalistic state sense, right? And the ANC simply is just more organized. They have more money, they have more resources, um, and they seem to be a more plausible route for many cats to join, and they join um, MK. The majority do join MK, um, who they go abroad. And there are, of course, those who kind of get swept up in these um, scholarship programs and get demobilized, but they get sent across the world to Sweden, Norway, Australia, the US, Canada, to do these uh, scholarship programs, you know, school programs, because many of the, these kids are young. They're 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, right? So um, I think in that sense is that, again, um, there are some who did join the ANC and MK. There are some who did join the PAC. And then what later became APLA, the Azanian People's Liberation Army, the continuation of Popoko. Um, and then there are those who I follow in basically mostly the first half of the book that now stick to a black consciousness line and form their own armed wing. But even that, they have their own splits. And I try to uh, follow some of the splits. And, and some of them aren't even splits. It's also just different orientations or depending on when you went out into exile, 
right? So some go out, leave into exile in 1973, and they're one wing. There are those who leave in 1976, another wing. There are some who come out in their mid, in the early 80s. That's another wing, right? Um, and we can get more into the detail as we go along in this um, interview. Thank you for explaining that. And I think it leads nicely to my next question, which is the, another area of your book I thought was particularly vital to understanding uh, South African histori historiography um, and the, is that the African resistance movements to European, uh, Euro-North American slavery and colonialism predates the entry of Marxism and Leninism as a tool for liberation and human history. And while Marxism at times positively impacted the struggle of African peoples against European domination, it did not uh, uh, define or even fuel it um, or fully understand it. I um, mean, can you explain um, what you meant by this? Yeah. So again, as you, you know, as the title of my book shows you and those of you who've read it and seen some of my work, I'm very inspired by Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, uh, the making of the Black radical tradition. Um, in some ways, it's a very misleading title, Black Marxism. Um, I still have curiosity of why that was the, at least that the, the title chosen, Black Marxism, because it's really very much not Black Marxism as a, as a, as an initial title. Um, the second part of it is the key thing, the making of the Black radical tradition, right? This is really what the book is about. And so essentially, if you just go there straight up, I mean, again, the reality essentially is, is that, um, you know, I think that I'm inspired by Cedric Robinson, and I'll, I'm also inspired by Michelle Rolf Trullo. He writes, this is a Haitian scholar who passed away a few years ago, who wrote a book, a number of stuff. Um, but he wrote, he writes this book um, that I like a lot called Silence in the Past, Power and the Production of History. And part of what he talks about, and I kind of bring these two together, is that unfortunately, I've been in, I'm in a number of, you know, of uh, formations right now in the U.S. I'm, I'm in Atlanta right now. So, of course, Stop Cop City. Um, uh, and another, you know, other, other formations as well is that a lot of how we understand and think about Black the possibilities of black radical struggle um, in the U.S. and even also in the, you know in the Caribbean and parts of you know Southern Af Africa as well, it's very much going to written traditions. And so, of course, if you're going to go to the written traditions that have been preserved, you're going to go to the Marxists, right? Because they are able to have their writings preserved. They're able to define and to at least define the terms of the debates on a lot of some of these things. For example, Harriet Tubman did not write. So we have to find her revolutionary tradition in a different kind of way. She didn't write a treatise or a manifesto and say, I am doing this inspired by these reasons and boom, boom, boom. They don't, they, they, they actually are running, they're, they're freeing enslaved people and running from slave catchers, right? Um, Dessalines is not necessarily writing a manifesto, right? Um, of what the, the Haitian revolution's central tenets are, you know, Book Mandani is not giving you a, you know, a whole booklet on state and revolution and voodoo, right? This is not what's happening, right? So you have to find the radical tradition in different kinds of ways. And Cedric Robinson in the first half of the book, or at least in the, in the, in the second third of the book, after he talks about the making of race in Europe, he now talks about now the archaeology of the Black radical tradition. He's now looking at the different revolutionary movements and the Maroons, the slave resistance, right? Looking at the different cultures, the traditions, the songs, the music, right? These are the different things that kind of help us begin to access Right, what political and radical um, imaginations people had at a particular point in time. So part of me writing that again is to also make emphasis and make clear that again, um, even right now, if you go to, um, for example, Marxist.org, for example, what you will find is there'll be a section called African Marxists. Right, um, that's I mean that's what they will have. Right, and you and they have and again documentation. They do have a lot of things. I read Cabral the first time on African Marxists and Marxist.org. Right. Um, but again, if you now read Cabral more closely, Cabral talking about returning to the source and Cabral never, ever ran around saying he was a Marxist Leninist. Right. He most definitely um, read it. He, he took things from it. Right. He took things from the Maoists. Right. He took things from the from from the from the Cubans. Right. Um, you know, there's a nice interview he gives uh, Cabral since we're on him. He says, um, you know, they're asking, you know, you know, you know, about Che Guevara and Che Guevara talking about, you know, the mountains, you know, and how that was key to our struggle. Boom, boom, boom. And Cabral's like, you know, well, and they're asking, you know, what are you learning from this stuff? How is that, you know, um, you know, helping you guys out? Of course, this exotification of Che Guevara, et cetera, et cetera. And then Cabral's like, well, listen, we don't really have mountains in Guinea-Bissau. <laughs> you know I me? Mean? Uh, we got, we got wood, we got a lot of forests, you know, but we ain't got mountains. You know what I'm saying? So he says, the people are our mountains. 
And so the idea is to say, again, we have our own traditions of struggle. And what Robinson talks to us about is he now just articulates for us, right? Again, the reality was Black people have been fighting enslavement and white supremacy for a long time before, before Marx was even a, a seaman in his dad, right? This is a long time Black people have been fighting for freedom. Marxism, actually, in my opinion, is pretty new compared to the Black nationalist tradition, actually. It's actually a younger tradition, right? Um, and it emerges very much, again, what really gives it its vir virility, if you will, um, is the Russian Revolution in 1917, which is late. People have been fighting a long time against capitalism, right? Um, that's late. Not saying it's not influential. I'm not saying people don't read Lenin, Marx, Trotsky, you know, Marov, you know, Plekhanov, and we can just run down the list, you know, Rosa Luxembourg, boom, 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 we can go down the list, right? I'm not saying we do not, but it is a younger and a newer tradition. And the point was more to say that, and I think in my next book, I'll do this better, is really to try to say, listen, there is a, there's a, there is a, there is a tradition of struggle that people have been moving towards. And indeed, there has always been splits. There are those who said, okay, cool, the white folks are here and they're doing this. Some of them try to accommodate. Some of them try to resist nonviolently. Some say, nope, we are never going to accommodate with these people. We got to burn everything down. Some say we're going to run. Running is part of a radical tradition to try to survive. Right, Marunage, even in the U.S., is essentially around movement and having to flee different spaces to find freedom away from the plantation. Right, so there's a numerous traditions that begin to emerge. Right, and Black consciousness, my argument essentially is, is like the PAC, a manifestation of a tradition that has already been there since 1652. So, for example, in the Americas, quote unquote, of course, 1492 is the date everybody thinks about. Right. For us in uh, Azania, Southern Africa, it will be 1652, right? Uh, when Van Riebeck and his other um, uh, Dutch colonists, if you will, begin to land there on the Cape Coast, right? And a whole bunch of different history things happen. You know, it changes hand numerous times, right? Um, but essentially, people have to resist against the system in particular kinds of ways. And so part of the argument is that um, Black consciousness represents this earlier tradition that now um, has been consistent throughout Azani and radical history, right? And indeed, they're learning from different people, but they have their own vibrancy and their own currency and their own fuel. Oftentimes, um, you know, my dad, who was in Swapo um, in the liberation struggle in the, in the, um, for, for the Libyan independence, he always talked to us about, well, the, the debate always was nationalism or Marxism or communism. This is kind of a debate in the 20th century, if you will, right? Um, and in some ways, what, you know, Cedric Robinson shows, that's in some ways a false dichotomy, um, in some ways. Um, although, of course, yes, it has, or there are things that we can point to where it matters, right? But on some level, if you think about it, um, uh, nationalism, I think, the, or, or part of how nationalism gets understood has been more of like a state-centric type of nationalism or a certain type of a conservative nationalism, I feel, has been projected out there as the nationalist position versus, in my opinion, some of the more radical Black nationalist currents um, um, that have a different history and have a different idea of what freedom needs to look like based upon different African uh, 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 ways of living and being um, that don't necessarily um, uh, conform to Europe's universe that have particularly come out of the French Revolution. And this is sort of a repetitive question, but I wanted to um, <laughs> dig in a little bit. You also explain how traditional narratives of the Haitian Revolution have historically been trapped within universalisms of Europe and its revolutions, and that we have to view the Haitian Revolution outside of the rubric of Euro, Euro North American human rights and revolution. Um, and part two of this sort of, again, repetitive question, I apologize, but I think it's so important to, to highlight this, is how does properly understanding the Haitian Revolution and the concepts of exclusion and domination help better, under, uh, help better analyze and understand Africa's dynamic and diverse decolonization struggles? Thank you for that um, question. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna return to the previous one real quick to kind of make a point, it'll, it'll transition. So it, what, something my father told me that was very, very, um, very interesting to me, right? Um, you know, I grew up with busts of Lenin in the house, you know, books on Marx and, you know, Kwame and Krumah, whatever. So like, I thought Lenin was my uncle for a minute. I'm like, Lord help me, this man's always up everywhere. I'm like, who is this? <laughs> Maurice Bishop, whatever, whatever, right? So I, I grew up, this was like how I grew up, which is different from others, right? So I, I grew up just with this being just common knowledge, not something that's like necessarily unique in a way, right? Um, but my dad always said to me that communism only made sense to him because he understood it as more radical village politics. It wasn't because it was necessarily something that he didn't know. It confirmed things he knew. 
which is the difference between saying that it is the one that gave you the fuel versus to say, okay, it provided a language in the European languages that I could now utilize to now do what we need to do, right? Which leads us now to Haiti, right? Um, Haitian Revolution scholarship, thank goodness, over the last 20 years or so, I would say, at least in English. In French, it's always, of course, going to be more deeper, some of the engagements there. Um, I'm sure Spanish also has its traditions as well, right? Uh, but in the, it's in English, the writing of the Haitian Revolution and its impacts in English has been really picking up over the last 20 or so years, I would argue, if not a little bit longer, right? Not saying there's nothing before then, but the idea is just as a, as a, a, a robust body of, of literature, right? And of course, if we go back to, of course, the seminal text written on the on the Haitian Revolution is J Black Jacobins, right? Um, from CLR James. Note again, it very much is a biography of Toussaint in the Overture, right? Which is interesting given James himself saying, even James himself is grappling with so many things because on the one hand, um, he is someone who tries to, to, to reject the idea of charismatic leadership and individuals being the ones who push revolution. Yet at the same time, he's having to fight against white Marxists and the wider racist society of his time in the 1930s, right? And again, Robinson writes this in his book, um, uh, Black Marxism, in terms of the analysis of James, right? He also has to now, in some ways, unfortunately, prove that Black people, individuals, can do things, right? Because the idea is that Black folk need white leadership, which is what James Dubois and many of them are fighting against in the Communist Party's uh, Claudia, Cla Cla Claudia, Jones, Cla Claudia Jones and others also fighting um, 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 are fighting this stuff in many of these leaders, these places, right? That the idea you need white leadership, in, you know, to, to, to guide the black, the, the, the black, the black, the black Marxists, the black, the black, the black masses, right? And so he has to now do some of this stuff as well. Um, but James himself also has to come under critique, right? I mean, he himself, some people argue, was the original Afro-Saxon, right? And even he himself, later in his career, in the, I believe in the seventies, I want to say, and a little bit later before he passes away, he himself admits that if he could have rewritten, um, if he could, if he could kind of rewrite the text with what he knows now, right? Um, he would have um, centered more of voodoo and the maroon traditions, which Black Jacobins does not do. It centers the Black, I use lowercase b, Black Jacobins, Jacobin from the French Revolution. And indeed, I think Toussaint was that. Toussaint, on, on the regard, um, Henri Christophe, um, Pétion, um, I believe some of these key leaders were Black Jacobins, because for them, what they understood was, we must see state power as the French Revolution does now try to do. We need to seize state power from the monarchy. We need to break um, this monarchy and spread revolution across Europe and the world, right? Now, their understandings of what radical stuff uh, would be had to get pushed and challenged by those in the colonies, those who were enslaved and those who were colonized, right? And the French revolutionaries themselves, as James expertly points out in Black Jacobin, he's a brilliant job in that book, looking at the the, the global dialectic, if you will, between what's happening in France and what's happening in, in, in Sandoma at the time, right? And the debates that are emerging in the French Revolution around who is a man, right? The rights of man, who is a human being, right? The encyclopedia that Diderot and them are writing these things, right? Um, what does it actually mean to Dessalines, who's on a sugar plantation being whipped? What does that mean, right? Uh, and so there is a split, of course. And again, I also talk about Chris Eddings and her book, right? Um, Crystal Eddings in her book, also read her uh, book, um, um, talking again to also Crystal Eddings talking about, um, in some ways, looking at if you think about the early years of Haiti, right, um, during the colonization of, colonization of the Spanish, right, she actually argues in ways which you can look at it, there's two Haitian revolutions. There's an Haitian, Haiti, an Haitian revolution where essentially the Maroons and the Taino Arawak kick out and defeat the Spanish. They do. I think people don't talk about that enough. They act as if it's just, well, you know, uh, they weren't as efficient as capitalists and they decided to invest more time in the gold mines and silver mines of continental South America and Cuba anyway and Puerto Rico is whatever, whatever. No, they actually lose <laughs> in, in Haiti, right? Because of the Maroons were able to run to the mountains in the guerrilla warfare they were able to use. Why? Because Africa did know quote unquote modern warfare. They didn't have the huge European armies and that type of a uh, classic European style warfare because the material conditions were not necessarily conducive to that for large parts of, of, of Africa's history, right? But they knew how to use guns. They knew how to do guerrilla warfare. They themselves knew how to like, they knew the land, they knew how to eat certain things. They knew what not to eat, what to eat. They knew what to use for poisons, right? They knew these kinds of things. So they came, they were full human beings when they came on those slave ships. They weren't just slaves. They were full human beings, 
right? We've had cultures, languages, rituals, discourses, right? And that's important because unfortunately they did not write in the slave pen, right? So we actually cannot necessarily access what they were writing the same way we could access what Trotsky was saying or Rosa Luxemburg was saying, or even what Frederick Douglass was saying, right? And so I think in that sense, you have a split that I see within the Haitian revolutionaries, right? It's multiple splits and it's very complicated. So I'm simplifying this, right? You do have stuff in the South with those of mixed race slash mulatto, the mulatto slash mixed race slash free people of color. You have those who are in the mountains, the Maroons, right? Coming from a legacy that's 200 years old by the time the Haitian revolution comes about that people like um, Crystal Eddings and other Haitian scholars and anthropologists before her have documented, right? You have that wing of the movement. You have Blacks who are like Toussaint who were trained in some of the European traditions, right? And so he knows what's happening in France. He's able to understand that, and, I, and that's actually very important too. You do have to understand the global forces in order to be able to play one against the other in particular ways, and he's able to do it expertly. If you will, um, he plays the Game of, the Game of Thrones very well. <laughs> right? Because he knows it, right? Um, he's being taught that in some ways. Versus some of them who are in the mountains, they don't care about no Game of Thrones. Um, they, 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 they're in the mountains saying, no, we need to reject these plantation systems. We're going to raid them when we have to. And they, they participate when they want to in the Haitian Revolution. Tucson is able to become this leader in ways because, A, he's privileged on the plantation. Um, he's, an, if I'm mistaken, he's Arada. And the Aradas um, um, were a particularly ethnic group in West Africa, I believe in the Benin area. Um, and um, he was able to have an Arada sort of uh, a leader, a secondary leadership uh, a ring around himself, right? And he was, a, because he was in a more privileged position, he actually was able to live longer than most Black people did on these enslaved plantations, right? Most Black people are living between two and five years on these sugar plantations, right? They're dying at rapid rates. So it's cheaper for the Europeans in Sandama to work the enslaved to death than it is to have the population, you know, regenerate itself. Right. So he to him being 50 years old, I believe, when the Haitian, I think in his 40s, when the Haitian Revolution starts, he's old. He was considered old man Tucson. Right. So he knew the different African languages of the different ethnic groups there. He knew where people were because he was a coachman. So he actually was able to travel around the place. And so he's able to now when the revolution starts, he can do a whole bunch of different things. And I think very important for the black radical tradition and another wing of our tradition that isn't talked about enough is that one of, I think, his best qualities, Tucson, which really propels him to leadership, is that he's a healer. He under, there's a book, I think, by, uh, her name is Weaver, I believe, and she writes a book, it's called Medical Revolutionaries, sort of talking about, actually, we think of what a hospital was in this European sense. It's not some great institution at the time. Hospitals where you go to die. <laughs> there's nothing healthy about a European hospital in 1750. Or, or you know what I mean, you'd rather stay at home. Right. So the Africans actually are more advanced than the Europeans in animal health, in human health, in dealing with malaria, in dealing with these different types of tropical diseases. Right. Because we're coming from there. Right. And Tucson was a healer. So Tucson represents this black Jacobin wing that says, OK, we're going to take the promises of the Haitian of, of the French Revolution seriously. We're going to push them to abolish slavery because we have to. All of our people need uh, slavery abolished. Right. Um, we're not challenging colonialism. Note, Toussaint was content being governor of uh, the colony for life, if that was going to be the case. He was content being basically ha having that relationship, right? Um, and of course, we're going to abolish racism, was the idea, right? Allow if essentially full participation in the free market economy amongst Black folks and the white folks on the island, right? But within the idea of colonialism, right? That is a wing of the movement he represents. The competition between Toussaint and, say, Andre Rigaud in the South is basically upon which one of us will lead this, this bourgeois revolution, if you will. Dessaline is under Toussaint's um, camp, if you will. Um, and, I, and, and Dessaline is also a very tricky figure because I may I have more of a positive reading on him. Others will see he was no different than anybody else. I, I, I freely admit I have a bias towards him. From what I have read on him, I think he was a revolutionary in a particular way. But then if you think of Dessaline, or if you think of some of the other maroon leaders of the Haitian Revolution and the wider population of the enslaved, they couldn't have given two shits about being a part of the French Empire. What they wanted was the end to slavery. They wanted to be able to produce and to grow the crops that they wanted to grow. We don't want to grow sugar and tobacco and coffee for the global market. Coffee, maybe, because coffee is less exploitative and intensive of a, of a, of a, 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 a cash crop than sugar production, right? Maybe some tobacco, possibly indigo. But we want to grow our cassava. We want to grow our yams. We want to grow our foodstuffs. You feel me? 
right? And that actually is what leads many of them to protest against Toussaint as he begins to reconquer the island from the British and the Spanish for the French, right? There are strikes and protests against Toussaint, so much so that before Napoleon reinvades, Toussaint has cut the head off of key segments of his revolutionary movement, particularly his grandnephew Moïse. He executes him in 1801, I believe, after he was sort of seen as the leader of um, some, of some plantation rebellions, right? Because Tucson is forcing them back on the plantations, this time with the wage, good capitalist as he is, right? But still bound to the plantations, right? Because the idea is we have to maintain state power for liberation and freedom. That's what he believed, right? Others said, no, we don't. We can reorganize this entire thing and we actually have to break this idea of state power as the central mechanism to securing freedom. Right. And this is the tension that someone like um, uh, Michel Rolf Trullo in his other book is called State versus Nation. Um, right. Basically, he's trying to talk about the origins of the Duvalier dictatorship because he's one of these uh, radical intellectuals who has to flee Haiti in the middle of the 20th century, fleeing from the Duvaliers. Right. Um, the dictatorship in, in, ha in Haiti. Right. So, of course, Haitian scholars will always be less starry eyed about the revolution than black folk who are outside of Haiti. We kind of have our stars on and our tears well up when we talk about Haiti, because for us, it's just such a, such a thing. But those of you who are inside, it, it, it's always going to be different. <laughs> right. How you see these things. So I think it's important to understand that because it also plays out, I believe, across the African liberation movement as well and the larger black freedom struggle as well. We have those who say we have to join the Democratic Party in order to actually transform uh, the, these, uh, the these, these state repressive laws to actually be able to in, to have uh, black freedom. We have to join the Democrats or the Republicans at a different point in time. We have to participate in state, in state, in state power, state legislation, right? In order for us to find this thing called freedom. Others are saying, no, we cannot do that. We have to be completely, we have to break from that and then do something completely separate. Now, those are two broad camps, as we know, and there's many splits and um, subtleties and dynamisms between them, right? But that split, I think, is important. And the Russian Revolution is not going to help you with this. Neither will the Chinese Revolution. Cuba can, depending on how you look at Cuba, because also the race question needs to be looked at in the Cuban Revolution far more than it actually has, right? Um, it's very notable, again, that remember uh, Fidel Castro and them, and James would talk about in the, uh, I think, an appendix to the 89 version, I believe, of um, Black Jacobins, or maybe the 63 version, I'm not 100% sure, but basically has a section called From Tucson to Fidel Castro, right? And in some ways, I think that that's a good comparison, right? From Tucson to Fidel Castro. Right. But remember with Fidel in them, Fidel is influenced by who? Jose Marti, not by Antonio Maceo and not by the enslaved black rebellions that were actually central to the, 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 the revolutionary activity in Cuba in the 19th century. Right. That's also very important to understand the Cuban revolution itself. It is a white Cuban movement that comes to power in the late 1950s, pure in a way. Right now, it needs the black revolution to actually manifest itself. Right. Um, and you have many people, for example, like Victor Drake. Victor Drake is one of these black, um, uh, black Cubans who was serving in the African continent, um, you know, uh, as a part of the Cuban forces in Angola, Ethiopia, and different places. But if you look at even Victor Drake's own biography itself, Victor Drake very much is coming not from Castro's movement. He's coming from local movements against Batista and against the, the global capitalist regime that had nothing to do particularly with, with Castro and with Che. Right. They join them because they have the most organization. And they're able to do certain things that others are not. But he is not indebted ideologically to Fidel Castro or Jose Marti. Right. And so perhaps maybe later in your discussions and, and building. So that's a long winded answer. But I think it's important because I think that Haiti does offer. We basically need to study it more as we have all these hundreds, if not thousands of books on the Russian Revolution and the Haitian Revolution, sorry, the Russian Revolution, the French Revolution, even the so-called American Revolution, right? We need to be having the Haitian Revolution spoken about in black radical circles on all sides of the Atlantic to the same kind of degree, right? People can cite you letters that Lenin wrote in 1893, 1904, and wada wada, but you actually can't do the same thing for the Haitians. I think there's some things there that we can learn from. Um, in terms of different wings of the movement and different ideas and orientations that we can, you can see happening um, between Black people who have to, who have to confront uh, racial capitalism. Thank you for breaking that down. I mean, I think that's so critical to understanding the, the broader Black consciousness movement that you get into in the book and just an important concept generally that needs to be talked about more and explored more. Um, and and you Switching to a, a, another question that, that does overlap, your, your book also brings to the forefront the experiences, <clears throat> political activism, and struggles of Black women in the Black conscious movement in South Africa 
In fact, you write that if the Azanian Black nationalist tradition is to mean anything of substance, substance Black feminist, womenist, and socialist feminist perspectives, to name but a few, must be understood to be part of its very essence as a method, theory, and practice. Praxis. Can you explain what you mean by, by this um, and say more about the role of women in the Black consciousness, consciousness movement? Absolutely. Okay. So um, first, before I do that, I wanted to give some shout outs. I actually am reviewing this book here. It's called Gorillas and Combative Mothers, um, Women and the Armed Struggle in South Africa um, by uh, Sipukazi Magatla. Um, she just wrote this book. It came out just recently. Um, very, very good book. I'm reviewing it for the Journal of African History. Then I have another colleague who I'm perhaps a little bit more ideologically aligned to, given her own Black consciousness politics. Um, is Zikona Valela, right? While this book is another figure, uh, it's called uh, Now You Know How Mapetla Died, the story of a Black consciousness martyr. Um, he's another figure of Black consciousness that does not get talked about as much as someone like Steve Biko. So I think one of your earlier questions was like, yo, who are some of the people we could look at, right? As people who don't get talked about as much, right? He would be one of them, right? One of Biko's close colleagues, but in of himself, a very revolutionary comrade and, and even more so than Biko in many ways, pushed the envelope more against white supremacy. Right, um, but again, he didn't write what he liked. To do, to paraphrase the, the famous book from the uh, compilation of his writings, right? He wasn't. He was very. He didn't have some of the white friends that Biko did. The Donald Woodses, the Alred Stubbs, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to document and to and to and to archive Biko's writings, right? He, you had to find him in his praxis, right? I bring her up because she's writing her. Uh, I think she's releasing a new book on um, uh, Winnie Matikizela Mandela, right? Um, and sort of writing to, to kind of a new, a fresh, in my opinion, a very well needed black nationalist womanist take on um, Mama Wili, right? So I want to shout out them first, but there are black women who are doing a lot of work and they don't get the credit that they, that they deserve. And I made it, a, I'm very serious that, you know, I'm not going to sit here and like kind of claim some of this unique stuff, et cetera, while there are people who've been writing this stuff for a very, very long time, right? So on the community fe feminism, I take that concept and I use it directly from Ulla Taylor. Um, she writes um, some stuff on the Garvey, uh, on the UNIA. I believe she writes a biography on Amy Jakes Garvey. Um, and essentially what she's trying to reconcile, as people will know, who have a sophisticated under analysis of the feminist, if you will, movement, is that there are splits in the feminist movement, right? It's not all one thing, right? Um, where, be, where it begins and where it ends, or, you know, where it begins or whether different waves come are also up for debate. Um, but essentially what I wanted to do there in terms of conceptually was to kind of just, you know, lay out certain things, but then also to speak to my interviewees and what they were saying. I like community feminism because um, I feel it's, it fits what who, the people who I interviewed and who I studied, how they understood their political mobilization. Many of them rejected feminism because they saw it as a white woman's thing, talking about bourgeois freedoms. Um, and you have some white women talking about they want women's rights, but then they got a problem with civil rights. Right, or they got a problem with the Black Power movement, or they're not, or they got a problem with the anti-colonial movement. To think of some of the European formations, right? And so um, uh, there has been, um, you know, there has been a um, a number of authors have talked about um, so, so uh, some of the some of the, so for, so Patricia Hill Collins, I believe, is in the early 1990s. I want to say writes an article um, that I found very very useful, kind of looking at kind of like talking about Black feminism and Black womanism if you will, right? Um, if you will, the Black womanism, just to simplify again, being slightly more Black nationalist, more, if you were talking about, it's like kind of more critiquing the Black feminists on the idea of like, you know, you know, uh, they, they, these ones feel they're a little bit too harsh on the brothers, right? That we have to actually be more, we have to, as a community, we got to be more together in this thing, white supremacy thing is all in particular ways, and we got to be more together on this one. Versus the Black feminists who are saying, listen, we have been carrying this burden for way too long. Um, and we actually, and, and black men are, are oftentimes part of the problem um, of white supremacy and racial capitalism, right? And so you kind of sort of have these broad, broad again, it's a, it's a broad distinction, right? But again, each of them have their own rich bodies of literature and political praxis, right? Um, that manifest themselves in particular ways. So the community feminism from Ulla Taylor, I like it because what it speaks to is the fact that many of the women who I interviewed and who I researched, right? Such as Mikiwe Machoba, um, De, uh, Mikiwe Machoba, um, Debs, Deborah Machova, um, 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 Tenjue Ntinso, um, uh, Masikela, um, some of these different women who I researched and try, I try to bring life to in the book, right? Many of them understood, if you will, they rejected feminism outright, many of them at a particular time, but what, because they felt it was white women who are now bringing this to them. And you're not even the ones fighting apartheid in South Africa, but you want us to be feminists. 
right? Um, there's a problem there because colonialism, race, right? Inequality, structural inequality impacting poor black women in ways that you white women who are privileged, particularly in apartheid, will never understand. They're very influenced again by some of the debates happening with the, the, the black women in the United States. Um, there's a really great issue in the black scholar in the early 1970s, where you have a whole rich debate throughout the 1970s in different issues, just having different visions of people talking about feminism or what or what black woman, you know, womanist movement should mean or should not mean in particular contexts. Um, so I'm drawing very heavily on that. But essentially, why I thought it was important for us to deal with it, unfortunately, is because um Someone my, like myself who has been, I am 35, so I do come from a particular political generation that's not the generation of the Black Panther Party. So many of us also are very much the heirs to some of their debates and unresolved contradictions. In many of the movements that I've been in, I was very influenced, again, all the movements that I've been in, all the radical struggles I've been in, um, to, 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 to briefly to have the gender dichotomy, women are central in all of them. It actually, it actually is a rare movement that is only Black men or predominantly Black men. That actually is an exception. Right to the that would be an exception to the rule, right? But yet, if you read the discourse, it does come out like it's a black men's thing, right? And very much how nationalism, black nationalism, and liberation struggles have been articulated is from a patriarchal lens and gaze. And I take the black conscious movement to task at different points for doing that at different points in time. So, for example, Boko and Mafuna, someone who I really respect and I think is one of the heroes of the black consciousness movement, if you will, he very much falls in some of these um, um, sexist uh, tropes and ideas when he felt that in one interview with me, he said, you know, women are not good fighters. They're good spiritually, they're good in terms of homemaking and nation building and peacemakers, but they're not good fighters. Now, he felt he was giving them a compliment because he was saying because they are so spiritual and they're so great at homemaking and community building that they don't want to destroy which is what fighting does. We have to reject that, some of us in, in, in the movement, right? That actually is not actually accurate to what your people in your own formation were doing, right? And if that's what you were saying as a key figure in this formation, what possibilities were submerged or sublimated or were not able to allow to grow given your sexist visions on how women could or could not uh, contribute to the struggle? And I say this with full respect for the man, because the man, is, I think, is, is, is amazing. But, it, but you can be amazing and still be very flawed, right? And it's not to gang up on him. This is something that many nationalists and revolutionary struggles have had a problem with throughout. And so part of what I talk about in terms of Black womanist, feminist, and socialist, um, uh, and socialist feminist uh, um, visions is because if you're looking at, for example, some of the scholarship that came, you know, some of the, some people like um, Cora and Presley, some of, you know, Valela, who I talk about, Magatla, right, um, and other authors of like, like this, again, all these movements, Black women are central to them. I, to, let me take one, Nikiwe Machova. Nikiwe Machoba is very, very, very important. She's critical to the Black consciousness movement. The Black consciousness movement, again, um, I gave a little brief stuff on it in the beginning, but I think people need to understand again that it was very much like, it's like if I say, like, like, like uh, you could never say there was like a Black power organization. There were many formations that now created this thing called Black Power. You have SNCC, you have the Black Panther Party, you know, you have the, Republic, the, the provisional government of the, of the Republic of New Africa, right? You have, you know, elements of core, you have some who are in um, NAACP, right? The Medgar Evers, these more radical cats in the NAACP, right? You have many different formations under the Black Panther Party, sorry, under the Black Power rubric, right? Black consciousness, something, black consciousness is something similar. And so Nikiwe Machoba is very key in the literacy movement and very key in some of the community building projects. Now, on one hand, we have to be careful and not just pigeonhole Black women in community development and teaching people how to read, right? As if it's, as if like that's the only thing that Black women are doing, right? But what we want to go deeper in is saying, well, this is something that they were doing. The question is, what, if, what, what did they see as important in these spaces? And what we begin to see in these spaces is actually it's, this is some of the thinking through and formation of what Black consciousness had to be, what a liberated Azania has to be. It's not just we come with guns and we take over power in Cape Town and Pretoria and we kick out the whites, then what? How will you build? What will you build? How will you build it, right? As we've seen now in the post-independent struggles, very much a particular kind of a continuation of the colonial patriarchal and hierarchical relations have continued because of their lack of a deep understanding of black feminist and womanist philosophies and liberatory strategies. Right. Um, there's a nice article by Young talks about, um, you know, another a person who gets um, talked about a lot in some of the, uh, um, 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 you know, it's, it's talking about just black women and armed self-defense in the civil rights struggle, right? Um, in the US, right? Part of what she says that's very interesting, I, I cite her in the book, is um, as 
when armed self-defense becomes is not hierarchically organized, it is more open across the gender, across the genders. It's less patriarchal and sexist. But when it becomes more of, quote unquote officially organized and more hierarchically structured, it then begins to take on patriarchal power relations, right? And you can see this with the ANC and even with the Black Consciousness Movement itself and how it begins to try to organize and exile. Right. And so part of what I also want to show is to show how Black consciousness as a movement, as an idea, as a praxis, people like Nikiwe Machoba, Masikela, um, 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 and uh, yeah, and Debs Machoba, right, and a number of other women like this are central to the building of Black consciousness. But again, because they didn't write like Biko, they weren't friends with the white folks that Biko was, their writings and their practice doesn't get documented. And because it doesn't get documented in a particular way, we then don't read it. And because we don't read it, we then think everything is Steve Biko. Because we read him, right? And so again, the silence, the silence is again, and this is where Trulo's book on silence has been so influential to me. Um, has been so influential to me because it is it has given me a, tool, a framework to, un, to, to peel away and to unravel multiple silences and how silences are created, particularly through the domination of the written word, right, as the way for knowledge transmission and preservation. And so Black women were central to the formation of Black consciousness. They were in the armed wing. They were the cultivators. They were in the schools. They were outside the schools, teaching outside the schools. They were in the health field. They were everywhere, <laughs> right? They were in the labor movement. They were everywhere, right? And so to understand it like that, I felt was central versus more to lionize particular women and to show what well, she could be, you know, unfortunately, Winnie, Madi, Winnie, uh, Winnie Madikizele Mandela, unfortunately, sometimes she gets mobilized as a figure to show well, we can be as militant as a man, we can be as violent, you know, we can be as da -da -da as a man can, right? Um, and that oftentimes is not uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the best way to document these kinds of things. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you for outlining that. And um, I know we've, we're at an hour, so I want to be respectful of your time. But I, uh, one follow-up question that we've just um, discussed, the, the women in the movement that haven't gotten attention, are there any men in the movement, uh, leaders, there were leaders in the movement that you wanted to discuss in the Black Consciousness Movement? Um, as, as you noted, that everyone talks about Mandela and Biko, um, but are there other people that you wanted to mention that um, haven't gotten mentioned. Um, okay, um, Ryan, can you maybe repeat that, unfortunately? Um, because I, there's a little bit, I think you got frozen for a bit. So even toward the end of my stuff on women in the movement, um, there was sort of freezing. So maybe oh, you sure. could maybe just repeat the whole question, sorry. Yeah, yeah, my apologies. You discuss um, in your book, many of the leaders in the Black Consciousness Movement. Um, and we now just discuss several of the women in the movement. and. Um, if you send me the titles of those books, I'll put them in the description of this video as well so that the audience can access those books. Are there any other leaders, um, as, as, as you noted, that Vico gets mentioned all the time? Are there other leaders that, that you think that we should mention today um, that they need to get mentioned? Yeah, so um, I could give names and I, and I will, but I want to just maybe follow up on some of what I was saying uh, in the last, just in the last, um, the, the last portion there is, Part of what I would like, I would like to see, right, is on the one hand, there's documenting, right, the women who we need to, and it must happen, right? But we also have to document and manifest their praxis. How were they organizing, you know, uniquely, right? What was their influences on how these formations were organized, right? It's not always revolutionary, but very often was, right? And so I actually think some of the strength with black consciousness, particularly when it now decides to pick up arms and to go into exile, much of how they decided to organize, the self-reliance, the self-sufficiency, not being beholden to the USSR or China or the Americans or whoever, right? We have to have a particular kind of a self-sufficiency with armed struggle, right? It comes from these revolutionary black feminist and womanist praxis inside the country, right? That's influential to the trends. Why? Because black women, as Claudia Jones so often said, right, you know, if you were the most oppressed worker, you know, is the most oppressed worker in capitalism, right? Suffering under gender, under sexism, racism, and, and classism, right? And so given that material reality, right, the practice that emerges to begin to fight that always has a wider space and a wider potential for transformative action, right? And that 
praxis is central to how black consciousness organizes itself, which for me, I think makes it unique of the South African um, liberation struggles, right? Because I really do believe they were actually the main ones who are pushing the organization to be less stiffly hierarchical, less um, centralized in individual leadership, right? It's one of the distinguishing things about black consciousness actually, particularly with Sasso, for example. You, if you were president of Sasso, you had one year, next, one year, next, 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 right? It's not just one leader who's in exile for 30 years, right? Who's the leader of the, who, 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 you know what I'm saying? There was much more of a rotation, much more of an understanding of a collective project, right? Which is why unsurprisingly, um, black consciousness through the Black People's Convention has, if you will, South Africa's first, if you will, one of South Africa's first um, presidents of a revolutionary organization, um, right, um, is a woman. And so I think it's important to understand um, these different things. And so again, with that, um, with that um, some of the names people are talking about, um, um, let's just, uh, yeah, uh, one second, yeah. Um, so, so some of the names uh, I think that we can that we can talk about um, is Bokwe Mofuna. I do think is one. Um, um, Abraham Tiro um, um, is another one. Um, a very very great leader. Um, very very great leader. Um, as well as people like Nikiwe Nikiwe Macho, Machoba um, is another one. Um, the first president of um, the Black People's Convention is uh, a cat named a cat named Winnie Kware. Um, she was an organizer for a long time, organizer, and they and they and they elected her president of the Black Con of the Black People's Convention because she had a deep history of activism um, and similar ish to Tucson because she was older than most activists who had been able to avoid prison um, um, and certain types of political repression. She knew a whole bunch of peoples in different parts of the country, right? Sort of that Ella Baker, if you will, right? Think of Ella Baker's activism. I also need to bring Ella Baker into this. Um, um, Ella Baker. Um, Ella Baker, for me, has been very, very influential to how I have organized and how I have understood organizations. Um, and I think that Ella Baker, um, again, um, uh, Barbara Ransby, for example, writes a book on Ella Baker that was very influential to me in graduate school when I read that. And again, I think, again, um, she has a very clear praxis. She has a very clear, um, you know, a, a, a non-hierarchical, grassroots-centered um, way of organizing and mobilizing people and resources. She, uh, I think just recently, there's a documentary that came out on Bloody Lounge. I mean, Hakeem Jeffries and others, I think, have been behind its production, right? Um, they have nice clips of her there, man. She's about to, she's going off on the civil rights leadership, man. It's like, yeah, you know, bye -bye, da -da 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 -da. and she's right, though, right? And she, and people really, again, she gets, again, people like King, um, Abernathy, some of these cats, people need to forget, they were not good organizers. They could speak very well in front of a crowd, and someone like King grew into organization, right? He became a better organizer, right? But it, but when the Montgomery bus boycott happens, it's the black women who are running that thing, right? But because the U.S. is patriarchal and, the, and our community understands that, they put these black men in front because this is what the society will understand and what they will listen to. Also, the reporters themselves didn't have an interest on Rosa Parks. They're going to King and the men, right? Right. And then a whole bunch of people have been talking about this in, in some of these books, right, about how Rosa Parks herself, right, had to actually was chased out of the movement in Montgomery because there was so much attention coming to her and not to the black male leadership. It's why she finds herself partly in Detroit. Right. Um, and organizing there in Detroit. Right. And so I think, again, I, 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 again, the names we can keep on coming with the names, right? Um, but really, what I want people to be centered on is the praxis, right? Is the way, the, in, the influence of a particular Black womanist and feminist praxis, right? That is very much tied to any sort of revolutionary grassroots activity, right? Um, that's really why I think it's important. And then people, even like my Petla, are also those who get silenced in that narrative because he didn't write and they didn't move in it, but he didn't he didn't come and give this charismatic speech where we're all they're like, oh my God, wow, da 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 da, da right? But that doesn't mean his organizing is any less, right? Um, you know, is any less, right? Um, you know, Malcolm X, part of why Malcolm X, we love him so much, we have a lot of documentation on him, and he is a particularly charismatic speaker, right? But I think you you, you can't understand Malcolm X unless you don't understand the UNIA, the Nation of Islam, Harlem in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, right? You have to understand all these social forces, understand how, understand how Malcolm X is even possible, right? And actually, Malcolm X as a speaker, as a person, is not particularly unique. Um, right in in revolutionary black national circles in places like Harlem or the U.S. in the late fifties and sixties, right? He is one of many leaders, right? And this is maybe to go back to the Haitian Revolution briefly, right? Tucson 
when he's captured by the French, right? And is basically about to be deported, right? He essentially to paraphrase Tucson, he says, um, uh, you think with arresting me, you, 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 you've destroyed the movement, but all you've done is cut off a limb from the tree of liberty. Its roots are deep and it has many branches. He only then understood at the end, right? Um, 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 you know, how flawed in ways his own praxis has been, right? Um, and that's, if you think of James's last part, latter part of the book, like the war of revolution, essentially, right? It's a mass-based uprising, right? Um, I think that's, I think, some of the practice that I would like us to kind of, to kind of lean on. But again, we have people, for example, let me just break this down on some names for some of the in certain waves of the movement. I would say one of the first key waves in the armed struggle for Black consciousness um, would be Bokwe Mafuna um, is one. Um, our Rilele Nikhalpo, he's still alive today. He's an he was an ambassador, I believe. Um, he joins the ANC, essentially. After, after the uh, Soweto uprising, he's one of those who joins the a a a ANC and the South African Communist Party and Unkunto Wisizwe. But Wilile Nehrupo was very, very central to um, revolutionary trends in South Africa, particularly Black consciousness. Um, uh, Deborah Matsoba, um, um, Deborah Machoba, Machoba um, Nikiwe Machoba, um, Nosipo, sorry, sorry, uh, Deborah is, is, so Deborah and Nikiwe are the same person, Deborah is her nickname. Um, so Nikiwe slash Deborah Machoba. Um, Nosipo Machoba, Nosipo is the younger sister to Debs. Um, Deds is, is the older sister. Nosipo is the one who actually goes with Boko and Mafuno and them into exile um, to form this first armed wing. Um, that's, I think, one uh, a very, very key, key, key wave. Charles Umthumbeni is another cat, one of my more favorite cats to interview. He passed away recently, unfortunately. Um, but one of those, again, who gave so much for the movement, and then you see how they're living in post-apartheid uh, South Africa, it's just tr truly horrendous. And I, 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 I'm going to center him a little bit because it was one of those kind of interviews where I kind of looked at what my what my possible future could be, you know, um, given the health cri health the health crisis he had at the end of his life, um, just living in a place that he shouldn't be living in, how just just struggling to survive, not having enough for healthcare and stuff. And many of our heroes have lived like that, right? They've given so much for the struggle, and they have not had the benefit of being a Cornell West or an Angela Davis to become these celebrity um, celebrity leftists, if you will, um, um, who never will be who will not be dying poor. Right. Um, and so I think it's important to kind of highlight people like this. Right. Charles Ntobeni is very clear in that first wave of armed exiles, but also in the second wave, because after the Soweto uprising, he chooses to stay with black consciousness and to, to stay the course and to reformulate the movement and try again. Right. Um, we have cat. We have a, we have a number of cats in the third wave. Again, um, Tandika Zondo is a cat who I, I had a, a great interview with her again. But again, um, one of these young cats who joined the movement and basically their youth was sacrificed for the struggle and you see how they live post independence of africa it's horrible right um it's very very horrible but tandika zondo she joined um what's called azanla that was if you will it's called the black consciousness movement of, Az of azania it basically was if you will the um mid to late 80s version of the black conscious movement after some bannings hit in the post um soweto era she joins azanla um she's one of those um yeah, I'm just let me just go quickly over to my book right now. I had some names that I that I that I written that I written that I written down here. Um, but you have people like um let's just see here. Yeah, do, 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 do. yeah, you have people like um uh, Musuburi Mangena. Uh oh, I love Musuburi Mangena. Uh, he's a very funny cat. Um uh, very smooth and cool, man. Still is. Um, after all these years. If I just had five percent of that man's swag, my life would be better. Um he's um he he's really he's really, really, really good. And Musuburi Mangena. Um, he actually is, Musaburi Mangena is an important name actually because he's actually the first black consciousness organizer who's arrested and put on Robben Island. Very, very important, Musaburi Mangena, right? Um, and so he's in Robben Island there um, in the mid, in the early to mid seventies. Um, and he's released after five years and he eventually, um, he's banned and then eventually escapes his banning and goes into exile in the early eighties. And he basically reformulates um, and re reorganizes the movement in exile after it's been just, it was kind of fractured and stuff. And, and there, are, there, it's a, it's a, it, um, there are a lot of fractures amongst the movement in exile. And there's a lot of different ideas of how the struggle was supposed to be organized. Um, there are those, particularly Charles Mpumbeni and some other cats who do not like Mangena. They feel he came too heavy handed. They feel he came too arrogant to them um, coming from inside the country when they had been in exile for 10 years, longer than he had. And they knew the international climate. They felt he did not work with them the way they needed to be worked with. His counter is that, well, they have been outside for so long, they aren't as plugged in as they, plugged in as they think they are. Um, and they actually, if the internal wing is supposed to be guiding what's happening outside, the internal wing has elected me as the president to go out there and to represent things. So whether you like it or not, if you're saying that you are fighting for the Black people inside Azania, 
the azapo, this move, you know, the movement inside has now chosen me to come abroad and to do certain things. So you have to, so I, I, I like laying it out there. You know what I mean? Kind of say, we would hear this, what organizing means, right? And sometimes whether you read Lenin or Mao, it won't save you in that situation. It's like, what now? Here's now the situation, what was happening? What, what, what choices do people make in these things? Another cat I like who actually builds the armed wing for the BCMA, his name is um, Skap Botseu. Skap actually is Afrikaans for sheep. Um, he actually is a really cool cat also, um, but um, he passed away, unfortunately, again, living in horrible conditions outside of Cape Town in Kalicha when I interviewed him. He actually is the one who reorganizes the armed wing, and he goes um, with another cat, Mabasa, to be trained um, by the Eritreans, um, uh, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front in Eritrea. He actually, they actually are able to make their way to be trained by the Eritreans, um, and they get trained there, and they're highly influenced by the Eritreans there, in particularly how many women were central to the armed wing of the EPLF. And so they're trained by the EPLF. And then they make their way back to Botswana, where um, Botswana and Zimbabwe is basically the two main places where the Black Conscious Movement armed wings were more housed. And um, they bring this training to this to this new wave of um, activists in the 1980s, um, and it regenerates them the, the BCMA struggle. So I could keep on going with names. I just wanted to give some of those folks and to kind of talk about some of their central contributions because um, they aren't talked about as much as say someone like Steve Biko. Thank you so much for going through through so many of those people and. I guess this next question is is sort of an overlap, and I apologize if it's if it's a repeat, but it's something we do try to emphasize on this show, and it's it's the importance of Pan Africanism and internationalism to liberation movements. Um, and in your book, you noted the regional and or transnational nature of liberation struggles, and that this development is significant because it shows how interconnected the decolonization movement needed to be, given the non-state bound character of colonial capitalist exploitation and repression and repression. Um, do you want to say more about this and or the importance of pan-Africanism and inter internationalism to liberation movements? Yeah, um, very, very important. Again, um, I also will have, I will also want to, I think we have to, you know, one thing I had to learn in college when I, when I came to college was, you know, I had a certain myself vision of pan-Africanism and that was not necessarily matching with other people's visions of pan-Africanism. So I, and I had to myself grow and evolve and radicalize my own visions of pan-Africanism. When I came to college, I was very much more of a state-centric Pan-Africanist, right? Um, in the sense of, you know, Kwame Nkrumah's Africa must unite, right? In terms of like states, right? Uh, coming together to unite in a particular kind of a way, right? Um, as I just grew and got exposed to more things, as I organized, as I you know, made mistakes and had triumphs, whatever, you know, and, and, all, and all that in between. Um, and then I, I read more, experienced more, um, you know, very much the Pan-Africanism that I look to is kind of Rodney's critique of um, the sixth Pan-African conference in 1974-75. Um, and basically what the rumor is, this is kind of what, kind of like he's like, this is either this is the article that chased him out of Tanzania, um, that Nerere ch chased him out of Tanzania, or kind of was his parting shot to being chased out of Tanzania, right? Because of his um, uh, uh, ra 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 radical activity. So I, I, I do align with Rodney on that. And I think in the conclusion of the book, I kind of point to that. And I think again, um, it's important um, um, politically, for example, I'm here in Namibia right now. Um, we are in what's called SADAP, the Southern African Development Community, right? Um, and the reality really is, is that um, whether people like it or not, you see what the EU, as much as we may critique the EU and all that kind of stuff, much of the reason why they're coming together is that they can't compete in the global economy by themselves. France can't compete, Germany can't compete by themselves. Shoot, the, the, the Brexit is the dumbest thing on earth. It's hilarious to me, actually, because the British think that they compete, no, you can't. Um, with, with China, with Russia, with Brazil, and particularly now BRICS is coming together, you can't compete with that, right? So, um, you know, us, uh, even from a free market perspective, you just can't, right? And so I think that um, if we're talking about the revolutionary radical perspective of these things, the reality was these were never, these are colonial borders. And that was Rodney's central critique of the Six Pack, the Six Pan African Conference, is that these borders were not natural. So us organizing and mobilizing from within these borders is problematic and actually is counter-revolutionary in many ways. And he was right, right? Same thing in the Caribbean as well, right? Um, uh, I have this um, uh, elder of ours uh, who was a part of some of the Trinidadian radical movements in the 1970s. Um, his name is Ako Mutota. He's there in Atlanta doing his thing still. Um, and part of what he talks about, you know, he came to my class to give a talk and it was a really great talk and kind of discussed with us how like Tr Trinidad, for example, that Trinidad historically is really very much uh, has been populated not only by Africans from all over the African continent, right, but from people from across the Caribbean, 
you find all kinds of Caribbean folks who have their roots, who are born in and then move to, you know, born in maybe Jamaica or I don't know, J Jamaica or Martinique and they come and they come to Trinidad, right? Um, um, it's very much a, 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 a conglomeration of a lot of different Caribbean peoples, as well as, of course, the different African peoples who come there, right? And that can be set up on a lot of the Caribbean, right? For example, Haiti and Eastern Cuba have always had a very strong historical relationship, given if you know how to use your boat, you can get across from one to the other, right? Um, those are very, very close there, right? Um, Jamaica, right? Um, people like Antonio Maceo, who I talk about, right? Antonio Maceo, um, I think after, again, I'm not a great historian on Cuba's uh, revolutionary movement in the 19th century, but what I do know, read a few articles on him, is that one of the things he was doing was after he's kind of has to leave Cuba initially, after a certain radical activity there, um, he's in Haiti, <laughs> as he would be in Haiti, getting support. <laughs> to, to, for this radical struggle against Spanish colonialism. He also was moving around the Jamaicans, right? And he had an idea for actually, what if Cuba, Haiti, and Jamaica could win, could fight simultaneously with each other and actually have sort of this pan-Caribbean unified uh, political uh, entity? That's a good idea, right? That's a very, very powerful thing, right? And so even if you so if you just look at some of these things in terms of a the colonial nature of Africa's borders right that still today is is, is destroying us right because these borders are not natural right the I, the nation state has hindered Africa in many ways because our our places you cannot homogenize us you cannot homogenize many of our spaces right because we have very diverse histories and the movement of African peoples in large part because of the slave trade and people running from the slave trade and the violence that the slave trade um triggers right. Um, people have been moving around even before slavery, right? When there was maybe a drought, people move, they travel, languages travel, people travel, right? So our whole history is one that is Pan-African, right? In, in, in that kind of a sense of it, right? In terms of the non-bordered visions of it, right? And because it is that way, right? Um, it will always be internationalist, right? Um, it has no choice but to be right um because its very nature is if you will international right global in that sense right um and so i think it's very very important um i think you know i think it's very very important also and again that people on the continent again the miseducation of the negro continues on all sides of the atlantic to paraphrase carter g woodson right um is that listen like many people here were not taught some of the history of what happens in Afro-America or the Caribbean, right? My mother's Afro-American, so I had a particular, again, uh, I had an advantage over some of the folks. But even me, there was so much I didn't know and I had to learn when I came to the United States. And vice versa, I teach on Africa all the time in my class and the students are just excited and happy, like, man, I never knew all this stuff, right? We actually come from a history, right? The Egyptians were black, right? No matter what people are saying right now about Cleopatra and this whole thing right now, I think it's hilarious to me because people would be funny about this whole Cleopatra thing right now, man, because it's like, dude, we don't know who her mother was. Why? Because she wasn't supposed to be the mother, she, right? Everybody doesn't know who her mother was. That's not by accident. You think they know who the pharaoh was having sex with? They know. <laughs> they had the idea he was supposed to be having sex with her, <laughs> so or at least having a kid with her. So I mean, so I mean, the idea is Egypt has always been an African and a phenotypically like myself, black country. Now, yes, Alexandria, certain key places on the coast have always been global cities across the Mediterranean, right? Particularly when you think of what's happening, what is now called the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera, right? But the reality is that it's always been a global international um, uh, uh, space, Africa. Africa has always been central to the world, right? You know, um, uh, Van Sertema has talked about they came before Columbus. Africans have been traveling the Atlantic as well as the Indian Ocean, as we now know, right? For a very, very long time. Right. But actually, you know, it's very funny how people want to, you know, I was making a, I was, I was making a joke in my classes, like how angry the U.S. and Europeans are with China and its trade relations with particularly, say, Southern Africa. Right. But I said, the funny thing is we were trading with them before you. Long time before you. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> Long time. Right. The Monomotapa Mono in Zimbabwe, the great Zimbabwe uh, structures. We now have the porcelain. We have the beads that is documented coming from China. In the 12th and 13th and 14th centuries and even earlier. Right. So Africa has always been, as many places in the world have always been, global. Right. Um, I think it's important to understand it in that way, particularly I always say again to my I will never, ever, ever, um, particularly in the in, in, in when I'm in the US, when I'm in the US, I will never refer to our people as a minority. We are the majority in the Americas. We are not a minority. But if you think in only in terms of the United States and Canada, yes, you're going to be a minority. But the thing is, we have to expand it outside. And that's why Gerald Horn's book in ways on white supremacy um, in uh, uh, Gerald Horn's book on Southern Africa, he wrote a few years, ago, I think in 2017, 
one of the things I love about that book is he's talking about this globe, the creation, the, the tangible material concrete, not just verbally talking about white supremacy, the tangible organizational material creation of a global white supremacist project. So much so that you have people who are fighting Africans in Southern Africa are fighting in the civil war. Those in the civil war are now fighting on the Confederate side are fighting in the Boer wars, putting down black people and the Zulu wars, right? Literally the, the, the connections are that concrete, right? That people are building a global white supremacist project because they have to, you can't suppress all of Africa only be in France or only be in Portugal or only be in white America. They are not stupid. So they themselves are creating a global white supremacist project to keep people down, right? So it's the only way we're gonna be, and again, and again, we haven't talked about environmental um, struggles as much, right? But again, I've always said the first environmentalists are the anti-slavery struggles. If you look at Haiti right now, in terms of how Haitian soil has been so denigrated and, 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 and denigrated because of the, the, the intense sugar production there, right? The monoculture, right? Right? Um, it has destroyed that place in terms of the, the soil. Haiti should be one of the most fertile places in the Americas. It should be able to feed everybody in the Caribbean 10 times over. But because of what slavery has done, it cannot. And then what the continued suppression of the Haitian Revolution does, it continues to do that. We, I, 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 I just heard right now about these forest fires in Canada and people in New York City and DC is getting sick. Mm -hmm. That tells you right there that you know, the nature doesn't see no borders. You know, na you know na the nature has no is no respecter of borders, <laughs> right? Um, you know what I mean? So what you do somewhere here impacts things all across everywhere, right? And that's why I think Pan-Africanism and understanding the global nature of these things is central, particularly in this digital world we live in, social media, internet. You know, you know I'm, I can be in the U.S. and Atlanta. I can talk to my dad in the village like that, right? That couldn't happen even 20, 25, 30 years ago. I mean, easily so, right? Um, but now, boom, connection is there. So. The global is central and this revolution, it can never be local, it has to be global. Although the local must always um, influence the global. And I do believe many of us in our movement forget that. And I believe I didn't have it when I came to college. I was very much this global Pan-Africanism, Pan-African and Pan-Africanism, which was also very much my own class privilege coming from Namibia as I was. Um, not, not understanding how much you have to really ground and build in those local community uh, spaces. As, as, as the basis and foundation for your global transformative struggle, right? Um, and I had to learn that myself because I wasn't coming, again, even though I came from a certain radical history, given how I grew up, I had to, I had to relearn these things and learn them in new ways, given a new world, right? So I, it's be, I have to be accountable to myself there. Like I had to also myself, you know, grow and develop and stuff, right? Particularly because people like the Museveni's of the world have so effed up the name of Pan-Africanism that we actually just really now can't it's hard to now say these things because so many people have talked Pan-African, but, but they actually is repressing people, right? Um, and in the name of Pan-Africanism, even some of our heroes like Sekutore, and even though Gaddafi never should have been killed and Libya never supposed to be invaded, we cannot sit here and hide from the fact that Gaddafi was repressive people, right? We can't, we can't hide from that. You know, even though again, not to, you know, again, F NATO and what they have done, but we, we can't just be, I think some of the old heads in the movement, unfortunately, are stuck in the world of 1976, man. And I have to remind people we're in 2023, right? This idea of like holding this line, you know, in a certain kind of way um, is not always productive to the revolution that we need to have going forward. Thank you for, for saying all of that. And I think it leads, the way you ended that leads perfectly into my, into the last question, um, which is how does the framework of what you just said and, and what you've outlined in your book apply to what we're seeing today in the world in terms of the US and the West trying to reverse the rise of a multipolar world. Um, this question um, I've been asking to most of our guests on the show because many of our friends on the left are saying things like the conflict between the US and China or the US and Russia is an inter-imperialist rivalry and ultimately that China and Russia seek to be imperial powers in a similar fashion as European colonial nations or the settler colonialist hegemonic U.S., um, you know, and how, uh, you know, how, how do we look at this conflict? Um, how, and uh, um, I guess, and, and we know that this conflict has directly impacted many African countries, including South Africa. Um, what is your sense of what is going on and how should we be analyzing it? Yeah, so here I'm just gonna now just you know give that more of a qualifying, not qualifying statement, just kind of give some context in myself. So I did my PhD at Binghamton University. 
and Binghamton University Sociology is kind of known historically for the world systems analysis. Um, while um, Emmanuel Walsh is the one who gets, at least in the West, gets more credit for its creation and thinking, those of us from the, uh, the, you know, the Black radical tradition, we look at Walter Rodney, C.L.R. James, right, um, um, Eric Williams, right, Oliver Cox, right, Claudia Jones, right, and we can even go further back as well, right, as the actual people who create this thing, right, because world systems analysis is uh, a third, a third world perspective, you know, the, 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 the dependency theorists, right, Dependen uh, dependencias, if I'm saying that correctly, right, in the early 20th century, right, um, coming out of Latin America, right, under Gunda Frank and some people like this, right, uh, uh, et cetera. So um, with that, where I, I'm answering it this way, I do think their analysis around, if you will, core, semi-periphery and periphery is useful in this, because if you think about what the world systems analysis essentially argues is that you've had different hegemons and competitions for hegemonic status within the world system for the last, say, 500 years. Now we can debate, is it an 800 year world history? Is it a 500 year old history? I don't want to get into that right now, it's not important. Um, but the argument essentially is that what you have initially, let's just say as slaves, because some of us would argue that, you know, Walsh in his um, modern world system volume one essentially sort of argues that it is the peripheralization or the exploitation, the colonization of Eastern Europe by Western Europe that begins to create this thing called the world system, essentially, right? Which sort of your like your your Norway, Sweden, whatever kind of being this like intermediary between some of this um exploit this, 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 these these uh, relations of exploitation and capital relations, if you will, right? Um, between say you know your Frances and your 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 Germany. Well, Germany doesn't exist yet, but you know the idea, the, the industrial, the Prussia, the German Germanic states, right? Um, and of course England, right? And its exploitation, particularly of Poland, right? Um, which is very interesting for the whole Ukrainian conflict now, et cetera. And I think Gerald Horn has been really spot on with a lot of some of his um, analysis and some of this stuff, right? So they would link it there. We don't. We link it with um, the slave trade and the creation of and it was the slave trade and with the colonization, enslavement, and genocide of well, the genocide of, of, of Native Americans, the enslavement of Africans as um, as laborers on the plantations, right? That is essentially where we would say the world system begins. And if you think about it in that sense, right, you have a competition initially right between shall we say your italian city states spain and the dutch right essentially are trying to now they're kind of forging out and creating this thing called this world system if you will right the portuguese get used sort of as the <laughs> as the as the i call it the shit detail if you will right the portuguese have always been exploited by the europeans it's called pigs for a reason with p in the beginning because the portuguese have always been exploited by <laughs> the western that way whether they like it or not um it's true um, and so um, while the Portuguese do get this credit for like, you know, at least in the European context for, um, you know, being the first Europeans to get to certain parts on the African continent and even the quote unquote Far East, right? Um, um, it very much was Spain and the Dutch fighting for this control over this world system, if you will, or, or, to, to this beginning point. And the Dutch, at least in the world systems analysis uh, discourse and doctrine, they would say the Dutch sort of went out. And then um, after the Dutch, right, Spain falls as an empire, as we know. Um, we then see what then happens becomes France and England then begin to compete, right? For now, who will kind of be this next, you know, quote unquote, um, hegemon of this now world system, right? Um, and, you know, for whatever reasons, um, we can go into them, you know, the British, you know, England sort of emerges as, right, this hegemon, right? And then the next competition, they would then argue, would be between Germany and the United States, right? Um, and again, um, if you think about what's happening now, it's interesting to think about World War I, um, and of course, the beginnings of World War II, right? So the British, for example, are very much pushing the Americans to get involved in the war. And the Americans are isolationists at the time. They don't want to get involved in these European conflicts because at least white America, at least, they fled these very Europeans, right? Many of them people forget that they're running from persecution, they're running from poverty, and they're running from exploitation. And in the case of the Irish, they're running from colonization, right? Ireland has always been in a colony. And in my opinion, they're still a colony, whether they like it or not, right, of, 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 of the British, right? No matter how the EU and their relationship to it is being negotiated, right? Um, in terms of the in terms of capital relations, flows of capital, right? Production processes and, you know, these things, it, it very much is subsidiary, right? And so I lay all that out to say is that now there's a cat named Giovanni Origi. Origi comes out of also the world system. Well, he comes up from other traditions earlier, but he, um, for a time, spends time in Binghamton sociology. He sort of, again, was pushing China as this next hegemon in China being this next, you know, rise, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he also importantly writes an article about the semi-periphery and the idea of rising in 
the capitalist world economy. And I think it was an important article because particularly with all these African countries becoming independent in the 1960s and 1960s, and of course with the Latin American countries also in their own influence as well as many of the Asian countries, if you will, as well. Um, the argument is, could you modernize to get your economies up to actually be on par with the West, right? And he sort of shows that it's not about modernization so much, it's about where are the flows of capital going um, where are the you know, where where are the flows of capital? Where are the production processes located? Right, who's controlling them? Who's benefiting from them? Right, um, this is maybe what you need to look at more. And if you look at it, it's very rare you see people going up in the world system from say periphery colonized, then going up semi periphery, and then going up further. It's very rare you see that, right? Um, and I think in some ways to now get more direct at the multipolar world, I'm not sure to be very honest, because I have problems if you're thinking, if people are looking at India for liberation, I have problems with that. The BJP is a, is a fascist racist party, and I have little to look for in terms of po positivity there. If you're telling me that India is someone who I need to be looking toward, toward this multipolar world or the Saudis, give me a break. It's a monarchy. Get out of here. Um, like, I mean, I, I mean, no matter just, just saying they're anti-American or they're, they're, they're not kowtowing to the Americans, it's not good enough. Right, even Brazil. I am very disappointed in Lula. I think Lula should not be running. Same thing with the, or Cornel, Cornel West trying to run. We actually need fresh, new ideas from a grassroots, um, new generation to actually push something different. Much of what we're getting, Lula, is simply this uh, reminiscence of the old. Part of what actually hits Brazil after Lula leaves power is caused by Lula, right? Um, and that's my at least my take on that. We can debate some of these things, et cetera, et cetera. The BRICS, Russia, again. While I'm not going to take this American side during the Ukraine. Right. Let's not, we're not sit around here and think that Putin and Russia is are such to be the, the guiding lights of how the world needs to be reorganized, per se. Right. Um, and I think it's in, in South Africa. It basically is still an apartheid economy. Black people do not have land in South Africa right now. Two thirds of the land is still in white hands. What are we talking about? <laughs> you know, what I mean? again, if we're talking about a liberatory transformative model right now, are we saying, do I prefer the BRICS or do I prefer, the, 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 do we like their critique of uh, U.S. hegemony. Do we do we think it's are there spaces we can organize through um, some of their 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 resistance to them? And so, sure, I'm not going to sit here and say that's not true. Of course, right? It's important, and a lot of and the U.S. hegemony has been so decrepit and so bankrupt morally, even financially. Lord help me, right? That there's no reason for them to be leading anything anywhere, right? Um, so that of course is the obvious, in my my opinion, the easy answer. Right. Um, also, I think we also can't get away from the fact that, again, China, it has a lot of U.S. dollars. Right. And if you have another currency, what happens to those U.S. dollars? Right. Those U.S. dollars, China has more of them, I think, anybody else in the world. China has them. Right. And so what are they going to do with them U.S. dollars? They always threaten this thing of this alternate currency, always gets threatened at certain points in time, particularly now that the U.S. has been so gung-ho about Ukraine and talking all this shit. Now, all of a sudden, LinkedIn is there crawling to the Chinese to apologize, essentially. I don't care what people may tell you, the man is there trying to, now he's coming there very humble like, right? Because they've been acting wild, right? And so I think that, you know, and I think that again, that yes, multipolar world, for me, the question is, where are people putting their money? They're putting it in New York City, DC, London, or are they putting it in Delhi, um, you know, Rio de Janeiro or Johannesburg? I mean, I mean, I think if you're actually looking where flows of some of these things are have the banking systems in these things. So for example, South Africa, 95% of the banking system of South Africa is owned by the British. So what BRICS are we talking about, right? First National Bank is a bank even bigger in Namibia too, Standard Bank, right? All these banks are basically, if you actually go back as Lenin taught us how to do, right? And, and, and you know, Lenin taught us how to do, right? If you actually go back and back and back, they're all having their base in the West, even, even India. Where is most of their capital being held and where's most of what's being held, right? It's not in India. You know what I mean? China is doing a little bit better, sure. But even them, their number one trading partner is the United States, if not mistaken, or at least top three. So my position for me is, is that, okay, cool. Let's not, I don't want us to exotify or get too excited for these things. And also to not, and also to not, and also to let BRICS abstract ourselves from the individual countries within BRICS and their serious problems, particularly I'll say in India. And China to an extent as well. Let's not again make no mistakes about these things, right? These they are repressive entities, these places, right? Now, are they better? Now, US is no different, I would argue, right? And the US is worse so, as Malcolm X said, is a hypocritical power, right? Because it acts as if it is not, right? So, yes, the US is worse, right? But as the, as the feminists have taught us, right? We, we, we deal with abusers. The idea of having one is a better or a nicer abuser than the other, this isn't the question. The question is how do you end abuse? 
right? Not who's hitting me once a week versus three times a week, right? This is ridiculous, right? We're ending slavery or we're not. Not about, you know, you're slave from Monday to Thursday, then weekend you got off. It's like, no, it's not what we're talking about. And so I think with the Brits, I think we need to be more real on that. Um, I don't like, um, and I'm arguing with my dad on this too, right? Because my dad is all in gung-ho on the bricks. He's like, yeah, you know, he's going to fight America. Yeah, you know. So my, you know, he, 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 he all happens. We, 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 debate, we debate on this point, right? So it, this is a family debate between like an older generation of radical and then like myself, right? Um, so our generation, right? So like I, I, I debate him on this. He's very happy with bricks. He thinks it's amazing. He thinks it's not revolutionary. It's, it's very, very progressive and it's good, right? And his, and his generation would say that. I, I, I am very skeptical. And um, until I see them have a concrete plan, for getting away from the US dollar, which I don't think I've seen so far. Um, I think all of this is just basically talk. And I think part of what the Americans are trying to do is to push China in particular ways to do more things. But the Chinese are basically saying, we are not going to run this world system the only kind of way you guys have done it. We will let you guys spend all this money and do all these things. And we're gonna be able to do our own things in our own kind of way, right? Um, and the Americans essentially are pushing back at that. In some ways, um, in some ways, at least the argument from rural systems will tell you that, right? That's kind of essentially what's what, what's happening, right? Um, uh, that's sort of my answer to that. Um, is it you know, Saudi Arabia wanting to join BRICS does perk my interest with the oil? And if they ever start to say that they want to, but again, I want to see the Saudis concretely say that they are going to push OPEC to no longer um, use the dollar as a means of exchange for oil. Then I, I mean, concretely come out and do that, not just make these, you know, not just gonna you know threaten it and talk and blah 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 blah, right? Because in my opinion, I actually think the Saudis are more trying to put pressure on Biden because they actually like Trump, right? And so for the actually that more, I think it's more about that really than anything else, right? Anything else, right? So um, you know, so that's mostly I would say about that. Positive, sure. Hopefully something good comes out of it, right? But I don't think we should ever for a second um, just look at the bricks and ignore what's happening in each of those bricks. Right, the B, the R, the I, the C, the S. Black people are still being repressed in Brazil right now. They're the majority of that population. How the hell is um, all the leadership still white, basically? The majority of people in Brazil are black, right? What's the black radical tradition in Brazil and how is it manifesting itself in the reorganization of capital relations, race relations, gendered relations, property relations in Brazil? Lula has not solved that question, right? Colombia, to an extent, they have their black vice president now and she comes from the land struggles, et cetera, right? That's a step in the right direction. But again, are they going to concretely be able to deal with the land question and deal with the sanctions that will come when you begin to take land from white folks, right? Same with South Africa. They're going to have to deal with that question until I see them being able to deal with that question. BRICS is not going to be um, what I think people are thinking it will be, will be my answer for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for such a um, sort of holistic answer, a thorough answer to that. Is there, those are all the questions I have for you today. Is there anything else you want to discuss you felt like we missed or we should cover before we close? Yeah, no, I'm good on my end. Um, mostly, I would just, I would just encourage you, if you could, to reach out to people like, um, um, to reach out to you know, um, Sifokazi Magadla, and to reach out to uh, Zikona Valela. I actually asked Zikona to come on with me, um, but she's doing her own uh, stuff at the moment. And mostly, uh, it would be good to kind of bring some of these, um, uh, new, fresh voices. Um, on South African politics. I'm not South African. I have not grown up in South Africa. I have visited there and I have done research there. And of course I'm Namibian. So it, there's a closeness there and there's an understanding there. But um, these are the ones I think, I'll be curious at their answer to the BRICS question, right? Because particularly them coming from, you know, as black women living in South Africa, I think it's important to get their perspectives. But I would more encourage you to bring some other these folks on for a discussion. But um, I have nothing more else to add. Thank you so much for this opportunity is the first interview I've done so far on this book and wider political topics. Um, it's kind of a good notation for myself of like, you know, I had notes of what I was gonna do and da 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 da. And so it's kind of gone where it's gone. Um, but thank you very much for this and please continue the good work that you're doing. Um, and let's of course keep in touch. Thank you. And I would definitely um, read their books and, and reach out to them and be honored to have them on the show. I'll, um, I'll email you to ask you to send me the names of those books um, so I can put them in the description of this video so that our audience can more easily access those books and it's been an honor to speak with you um, and learn from you some more and i hope to have you back again soon thank you and stop cop city stop cop, stop cop city, city.